We're quite certain that that video from David has made all of us think. Uh, we would like to remind you that you can donate at uc-2020.com and that we are supporting charities providing COVID-19 relief efforts and supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. They include Inner City Arts, Black Lives Matter, Artist Relief, the Loveland Foundation, Doctors Without Borders, MBK Alliance, World Central Kitchen, House of Ruth, and Black Visions Collective. We'd also like to remind you that we have digital care packages available on our website, the one for David Cho. The password is it all adds up. We also have two very special gifts from our upcoming speakers. One from Evan Kleiman, the password for it, which is good food, G-O-O-D-F-O-O-D. -O -O and one from Craig Maud, the password for which is walking, W-A-L-K-I-N-G. As a reminder, you can also check the at Unexpected Connections Instagram for more content and to ask our speakers questions. So for our upcoming segment, we are speaking to Evan Kleiman and Craig Maud. Evan has been the host of Good Food on KCRW since 1998. She's done thousands of interviews on the world of food and drink, which is perfect because she loves nothing better than learning and sharing all there is to know about humans and how food interact. She's also a chef with nearly 30 years of experience under her belt before walking away to focus on authoring cookbooks and teaching on the cultural subjects that touch food. Craig Maud is a writer and photographer who has called Japan home for most of the last 20 years. He has written for Eater, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, Wired, California, and others. He is the co-author of the books Pachinko Road, Koya Bound, Eight Days on the Kumano Kodo, and Art Space Tokyo. We're really excited to have the two of them together with us today to talk about the dedication to a pursuit and how a journey is required to gain new perspectives. Let's go live to them. Hi, Evan. Hi, Craig. Thank you so much for calling in from your locations. Um, it's a pleasure to have both of you here to talk to each other. Thanks for Hello having there. me. Thanks for having us. Yeah. What a treat. Yes, a treat for all of us and for our viewers right now. Um, just to open, you know, something that I alluded to in the bios is, Evan, you've been hosting Good Food for 22 years now. Um, and Craig, I mentioned that you walk, but I didn't say how much you walk. And so for an example, last year you walked over a thousand kilometers along the historic Nakasendo Highway from Tokyo and Kyoto. So I think like for me, a similarity between the two of you I see is how you play the long game. You know, you commit to doing things that other people would maybe balk at doing. Uh, so what has sustained your interest, your individual interest in food and walking for all of these years and all of these kilometers? Um, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this, how my mother's mantra was even on her voicemail. She would say, I'm out putting one food I'm out putting one foot in front of the other. And it's something that she said to me always that let your curiosity take you where you need to go. And, and for me, the journey into uh, my subject is driven by curiosity. And then it's fed by the constancy of the practice, I think. So it becomes like a like a, a hamster wheel with no end <laughs> that has its own energy that keeps it going. Because as you take in more, you learn more, and then your focus shifts and your curiosity expands. It's, and I have to say to Craig, the hilarious thing to me about being paired with him is that... Um, I'm the kind of person who reads books about walking <laughs> instead of just walking. He's the one that the writes books about walking. Right. <laughs> well, I, I lived in Japan for 13 years before I started uh, doing sort of what could be called serious walking, if there is such a thing as serious walking or more, more kind of intentional walking. Um, and you know, I thought I knew the country well, 
you know, 13 years is, is quite a long time. Uh, I moved here when I was like 19 and uh, went to university here and, and I, I've hitchhiked across the country. Uh, I've done a lot of traveling in Japan, but uh, it wasn't until I went on, I was invited on a walk seven years ago that um, I realized I knew so little about sort of the real uh, historical depth of the country and uh, in terms of just deep interactions with, say, like the countryside or folks in the countryside. I've spent, you know, 98% of my time hidden in the center of Tokyo, um, really not leaving the city too much, just for little excursions every now and then. And so that first walk I, I was invited on by a friend and mentor and, and scholar, Japan scholar, uh, seven years ago, really kind of just opened my eyes to the fact that I knew nothing about Japan. Like, I had just the most superficial sense of what Japan was or its history. Um, and so that, to me, really activated uh, the interest. And it became this sort of, in the same way when you learn a new language, um, you kind of get more and more excited the, the further along you go up, the, up the, the pole of language skill. It unlocks all these different things. So it's like, oh, now I can read these sorts of books. Now I can communicate with these sorts of people. Um, it felt the same way with the walking. And the more I did it, the more I felt my understanding and connection with the country deepening. And um, that was just really exciting. And so last year uh, was sort of my most formal year of walking where I started the membership program and I did the, the huge Nakasendo walk and a bunch of other walks. And, you know, I'm at a point now where I'm doing, well, this year, obviously a lot has <laughs> changed because of COVID. Um, I was supposed to be on a big walk right now, but for the most part, I'm doing two to three full months of walking a year in Japan. And um, it's all in service to this desire to, to, to understand this place better and, and to connect with it in a, in a more deeper way. Yeah, I think I'm, what I'm hearing both of you kind of talk on the theme of, you know, regarding food and then walking is this idea that as you keep going, the the journey gets deeper or the hole gets deeper. You know, there's there are still layers that you're kind of working through and revealing. And I've just wondered, but has there, because, you know, you, Craig, you said you've been in Japan 13 years and Evan, you know, as a host of Good Food for 22 years, has there ever been a moment where you felt like, oh, maybe I've kind of reached the end of this journey or like maybe that I've, I've tapped as much as I'm going to tap or has it always just been like, the more I do, the more I learn that there is still is to learn? Um, for me, I mean, I have a kind of analog experience um, to Craig in that in my late teens and early 20s, I figured out how to spend every other year several months in Italy without having to pay and um, as part of my education. And, um, and, and that kind of grew simultaneously out of a culinary connection because I always cooked it, so I put myself through school. And that, that need to not race through somewhere, but to sit in a place and, um, and deepen your knowledge by just being there is um, was for me incredibly potent and became sort of like a template of the curiosity that would overtake me for the rest of my life. Um, because I think what I learned um, as a kid who all of a sudden was in a very different place, a much more rural place, because in the 70s when I started traveling there, it was not as urban-based as it is now. Um, that, And I grew up in L.A., so um, this connection of food and culture, which didn't exist where I was from, um, was so profound and it was so tied to place. And the more you could experience place slowly by, I would pretend like when I was 18, I would pick a town and pretend like I lived there. And maybe it was five days or maybe it was two months. But then I started to realize I wasn't pretending <laughs> that I actually was living every day. And once you slow down, I think that you see, you just see things in a different way and it becomes um, necessary. Mm. I don't know if that sounds familiar to you at all, Craig. 
Yeah. Oh, oh, what you just said about sort of assume, assuming an identity, it's almost like, 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 uh, in Japanese, you'd call it cosplay, like costume play or whatever, um, of becoming this person for a set period of time, but then realizing you are actually becoming that person. I feel that so acutely on the walks. I think this is why a walk for me, especially a walk over kind of an extended period of time feels especially powerful more than like, you have all these different layers. So if you're in a plane, you get that superficial macro view. If you're in a train, you get kind of the quick view of a place. If you're in a car, it's a little more control, but still you're in a bubble. And even a bicycle, you're moving at a pace that's difficult to stop and, and contend with every, everyone that you're passing by on the road. But when you walk, you, you're, you're going past people really slowly and you have to choose who you want to be that day. And um, I found in my walks, that there's almost this sort of uh, this almost like spiritual experience of every day you wake up and you're reborn in a way. Like you can choose who do you want to be today because you're going to pass by all these strangers and you get another opportunity to redefine who it is that you are and to, you know, to choose to engage once again uh, as deeply and sort of with empathy and love uh, as, as you can muster to these folks, these strangers that you're meeting along the way. And um, much like, uh, to your point, Evan, it's like you, you kind of do that in repetition long enough and you realize that those habits and those emotions and those feelings of this persona that you're projecting into just become part of who you are on a day-to-day basis, even when you're not out doing the walks. I love um, the goal you set out for yourself of taking portraits by 9 o'clock in the morning, was it? 10. <laughs> Nine's too early. 10. <laughs> But I, I thought that was just fascinating because it it means that you must interact with somebody in a very intentional way at the very beginning of your day, which must set the tone for the rest of the day. Totally. It's such an un- unlocking habit hack. You know, it's, it's, you see that it's uh, getting closer to 10 a.m. And even though it's this artificial, you know, sort of constraint that you set, um, it works. I mean, so much of, of, I think creativity is, is, is contingent on constraints, real or artificial deadlines, things like that. And yeah, Evan, you're absolutely right that by opening up myself and sort of taking that risk and doing that vulnerable thing of asking to, to photograph someone and having them come into a space and creating a space where they don't, where even though they're, they're kind of being vulnerable to me, um, you know, they're, they're enjoying it and they're having fun. Um, totally, totally is such a tone setter for the, for the entire day. I think that's a really good way to segue into a question I wanted to ask about habits and ritual, I guess, about how when you continually investigate or continually commit to doing one thing, you reveal new aspects about it. And maybe to bring it back to Evan, since Craig talked about taking portraits, you know, how have you discovered that repetition, whether that's um, a segment on your show or a recipe unearths more for you? Well, I think my whole culinary life, my chef life was all about that repetition and handwork, um, which for me um, is everything. I mean, it keeps me from going insane. And it's interesting because I think of this period of time and the first thing that came into my mind when you were formulating your question was doing the dishes because I think doing the dishes is so um, has so much uh, metaphor attached to it, and it's something everybody is doing now more than they ever thought they would ever do in their lives. And um, it, I love it. it. It's and it's how it used to be when I worked in in the restaurant. That at the end of the night, you would put everything away, and then you would just clean like you had never cleaned a space before until it was absolutely spotless. And the sense that you have of an ending of a day so that you can begin a new day at a, um, you know, just at zero to start over was so um, comforting. Um, So there's that, but also I would say that, um, for me, just making food is 
the using my hands in a way that now I've done it so much requires no thought. It's like driving. If you've driven since you were a teenager, by the time you're middle-aged, you don't even think about what you're doing. You just do it naturally. Um, I find the physical practice to be incredibly anchoring. Um, mm. So this period of time, actually, of being home and having to cook every day and do the dishes and not feel guilty about using that time is the one part of this whole situation that is a blessing. Mm. Craig, that actually kind of reminds me of something you wrote. I don't know if you want to talk about it, but when Evan was talking about doing the dishes, it reminds me of something you wrote about changing your kitchen space to be just 1% better every day. And I was wondering if you also hit on the same thing that Evan's saying about like that kind of making food and then tidying being an anchoring part of the day. What is yeah, 1% no, uh, better? <laughs> <laughs> I need to know that. What, uh, it's, like, it's, uh, it's like going, all right, well, what, you know, what could I, you know, how can I organize this one thing a little bit better? Like, do I, do I need a, do I need a new container for my pasta? Like is, is pasta in like kind of a weird pile in the corner? Is that the, the best way to store my pasta? Or like, I was thinking about like, do I, oh, do I need tongs? Oh yes, actually I do need tongs. Like I don't have a, I, I don't have a good set of tongs. It's like, so just every day, just thinking about what kind of isn't working. So taking a step back, and going, what in this space isn't quite working? And if I look at my um, my kitchen, I should have taken a photo of it, like before the, the the pandemic. And it now, it's just a completely different space, but it all in service to being able to use it more efficiently. And you know, have a, it's a working kitchen now, as opposed to kind of this thing that I used to sometimes engage with. But you know, now I, I'm engaging with for two or three hours a day every day, um, which. For me, you know, it's funny. There's a lot of obviously negative that, came, that that happened during the pandemic, and it's still going on. But for me, this changing of my relationship with the kitchen space uh, is so profound. And I, I, this is something I'm going to take with me through the rest of my life now, and I, I, I feel really grateful for that. But I think, you know, to your to your point, Evan, about um, like doing dishes. You're, I mean, the kind of the if you step back a little, it's really a discussion of maintenance. And I think for any creative practice, maintenance is so critical. You know, it's, it's, I think people sometimes forget, like I, I run an office hours quarterly with members of my member membership program. And I ran one a month ago. And uh, most of the questions were about being a better writer. How do you become a better writer? How do you know, what are, what are tricks? What are tips? And it's just, you know, all you have to do is, work at it every single day until you're dead. That's it. That's all you have to do. Every <laughs> single day. Yeah, that's it. You put just, one foot in front of the other. That's all you have to do every single day until you're dead, spend like two hours with everything else turned off and write. And, yeah, uh, and then when you're not doing, when you're, when you're not doing that, uh, tr make sure you're reading great books for a couple hours a day. That's all you have to do. That's the trick. <laughs> But you, but you can never stop. You, just, you know, it's that until you're dead thing that that is really, I think, key. Um, there's no magical line you cross, and then it's like, oh, it's all easy now. Uh, and the same thing with dishes. Like it's, you, it's not like you do one giant dishwashing session, and then oh, I'm done with dishes for the rest of my life. Yeah, I'd love to know how many people switched permanently to paper plates now. <laughs> On the subject of writing, since both of you are writers, um, but at the same time, while writing is a solitary activity, like Craig said, you know, something that you do by yourself for two hours and you try to turn everything off and you do that, you both have this constant communication with a dedicated audience that have really chosen to be, you know, in tune with what you're writing and what you're saying. I was wondering how does knowing that you have those audiences, you know, through good food and through the Explorers Club, like change your work or change how you approach um, making and presenting your work? I have thought so much about this this week, especially more than I've thought about it ever, maybe. Um, I mean, 
I feel a great responsibility to try and hold in the way I interact with people because the work that I do, I'm always in service of somebody else. You know, I'm in conversation with somebody else. So I want to be of service to them, but I want to also be honest and be me. And I don't want, and then you have you have to hold what the moment is that we're, you're living through because it's radio, so it's present. Um, I don't know that I have an answer. <laughs> I'm just thinking a lot of thoughts about it right now, about my failures, and um, and how I'm going to go forward, and how it will change. Uh, my team, we've been talking about nothing else for the last several days. I don't know. I'm, I think. I'm, please. So I was just going to say, I'm just, I'm just so in awe, Evan, of your, uh, like the amount of output and the amount of, uh, you know, sort of uh, reach you have, and um, you know the the kind of the scale that you're operating at is, is so, is so powerful and inspiring. Um, but it's, I would, I would but love on to, one uh, level, I, it's just food. But then on another is, level, it isn't just, it's, it's very odd. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't, I think for both of you, this is my personal take. I don't think it's just food or just walking you, I don't, I don't have an answer either. And I totally accept, you know, that the two of you might not either, but um, you've brought together readers around a certain subject, but that doesn't mean you are limited to just talking about what, about food and walking. And I also think that those two subjects actually touch on so many other things. You know, uh, Craig, if you had, um, you want to elaborate. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like, obviously I, you know, I have no no experience with what's happening to people of color in in the states. Like like that that's not something I can I can talk about or write about with any authority. You know, and so the best that I can do is point you know parts of my audience towards you know great institutions that are that are doing incredible work that are that you know can help move these things forward. That's that's kind of how I see uh, my position with that. But I do have uh, the ability to, to sort of go deeper on other social issues. And so like one of the things that, you know, for example, that is connected with walking. And even though I, I, a big part of the walk last year was about food and about pizza toast, um, you know, a lot, a lot of the, the, the places I was walking through and the Kisa Ten, the cafes that I, I was going to and patronizing um, are parts of Japan that are being depopulated. And this is a, a, a real social issue that is affecting uh, immigration issues. It's affecting uh, pension issues. And, um, you know, it's one thing, again, this is what's so powerful about walking is that it's one thing to read about these issues in the abstract um, and to go, oh yeah, okay, great. Yeah, the Japanese population, if you look at it statistically, yes, it's, it's becoming more and more top heavy. And what does that mean in terms of, you know, accepting immigrants and giving immigrants a, a better position in Japanese society? But it's another thing to, like, to walk through the countryside and see and feel these towns and villages that are disappearing in real time. And to go to a bunch of these shops and restaurants that are of an archetype that within, like, 10 years won't exist anymore. Okay, in, in a lot of ways, sort of like the New York Manhattan diner, you know, kind of disappearing from the, the landscape because of costs of rent and, you know, changing uh, sort of uh, socioeconomic, uh, you know, uh, makeup of, of, of uh, neighborhoods in Manhattan. And so, you know, for, for the walking work uh, and, and for my membership program, I've tried to focus on the things that are, that I'm having a direct experience with. And I found that to be really, really powerful. And for me, if I could just go back for a minute, when you do something like this for as long as I have, you 
there's just layers and layers and layers, and you start to see all these connections. And obviously, there there are these through lines, these truths that become revealed through food that I think this moment we're seeing in abundance from the brittleness of the um, food chain, um, poverty, hunger, um, related to the gig economy and um, struggles of people of color. But um, another thing that I do when I'm lucky enough to do it is I teach um, food studies at um, UCLA. And the class that I teach is called um, We Are Stardust. And um, because literally we are. And the ideal, the idea from soil to through soil, through photosynthesis, through plants and animals, um, that who we are as humans, that we basically mediate nature through food, um, is something that becomes ever more fascinating to me. And, um, and so I'm always torn between um, telling the huge story in a personal way, you know? Yeah, I, I, I see that as well. I see the two of you, I'm, we've been talking kind of big picture, but you two tend to use more specific examples, you know, uh, intensive research, being detail oriented in order to explain those bigger sociopolitical cultural ideas. It's endlessly fascinating. And, and Craig, you have to come on Good Food and talk about Kisitan because oh, now absolutely. I am obsessed. <laughs> it'd be, it'd obsessed. be my honor. <laughs> I've heard that that Eater essay was heavily redacted, so maybe you can go on Good Food and correct some of the redactions. Well, it, it, was, it was just truncated. Sure. And <laughs> it's, Sorry, not redacted. It's being... It's being it, yeah, well, there wasn't there wasn't any controversial CIA reveals in in the in the pizza toast method. Um but it's it's actually the redact the 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 truncations are being put into a book that that I'm finishing up right now. So um, oh, perfect timing. Uh, oh, I love yeah, how the two so, of you are so, like crossing over one writing about food and the other about walking and yeah, moving forward. That way. So spaces just seem magical and so sad to let them go just also the physical spaces and I, I believe that when you know I had my restaurant for 27 years and some of these places that you explored have been run by people for 50 years How, what an amazing place to walk into just oh, uh, unbelievable unbelievable it's like I mean walking into museum set pieces you know and the Kind of the heartbreaking aspect of it is a lot of these kisaten were started not because these people had um, an obsession with kisaten or that it was their dream to run a kisaten, but because of the the economic situation, post-war economics, what was happening in Japan in the 50s, 60s, um, necessitated that like this was in some ways the only option they had. So they don't see their children as uh, you know, being able to carry on the Kisaten, carry that flag, um, because they see it kind of almost as a as a as a choice they wouldn't they would never want their children to make. So it really is for a lot of these these establishments, this is the final generation to be running them, and um, and and so you know, there's something kind of heartbreaking about about witnessing that, but you know, also something you know beautiful about watching this kind of cycle sort of make its make its loop um, and come to an end. Okay, unfortunately we have, that's all the time we have for this segment before we move into the audience Q&A. It really does sound like, I will wait for the good food episode on pizza toast between the <laughs> two of you. Um, so if, you, if the two of you stay with us, we will move in a second to audience questions. Okay, I have this first question from Mary in Honolulu, who says, Hi, Evan, I love your show. I wonder if you have plans in the near future to highlight more POC restaurants or chefs 
specifically social justice oriented and black owned restaurants. Thank you. Well, I think that the show always has had a social um, justice bent, always. Um, and probably in the past, um, a lot of our stories that focused on that were agricultural, but absolutely yes. Um, we already started with last week's show and um, we're meeting constantly about how, how just a greater awareness of the power we have to move the mic, so to speak, in one direction rather than another, will never go away again. No. Is there any chance you want to speak about anything specific that you have that you're well, looking at? Well, um, next week's show, you know, over the years, we've done a lot of segments um, uh, with, um, people of color and, and talking about um, the various cultures related to, to um, that, that live with people of color because the culinary cultures aren't monolithic by any means. Um, and so next week, as an exercise, we're going to revisit quite a few of the segments that we've already done. And one of them that I'm really looking forward to airing again is um, when a book came out called Thug Kitchen, written by um, um, two white people, a, a young white couple, and um, a lot of people took umbrage of it. And it was one of the few um, interviews I ever did where I was sort of journalistically um, putting people's feet to the fire, because typically that's not what I do. And then I had an opportunity to break down um, the reaction to that whole scandal with Bryant Terry, who's just a really wonderful um, thinker and author, um, cookbook author in um, Northern California. And we're going to um, re-air that segment this coming weekend, along with many others. No, oh, look forward to it. Um, we have a second question that's for Craig, and it's from Sam in Los Angeles. The question is, is there an overarching objective or personal quest guiding all of your projects? And how do you feel about your progress on this front? Oh, man, uh, hit me up with the easy question here. Uh, <laughs> Two-parter. <laughs> so uh, so my, co my cosmic guiding principle for uh, eating pizza toast is, uh, <laughs> no, there's, um, uh, I mean, I guess like to just speak, uh, broadly about this is w one part of my past that is sort of present in all of this work that I'm doing and in my desire to kind of feel closer, I guess, to a place and to understand a place more deeply is that I'm adopted. And so this element of being adopted and this element of sort of uh, genetic disconnection from groups uh, as being kind of implicit to my experience of the world um, it's certainly something that I keep in mind, and there's definitely, uh, you know, a strong case of psychoanalysis as to why I'm living in Japan as, as sort of, you know, a response to this as well, I'm sure. Um, so I'm very, very interested in what it means to be um, part of a group, what, what it means to integrate, what it means to be part of a family, um, and where those kind of lines sit and uh, when they're crossed and how you can cross them and when they're also uncrossable. And, um, and so that, that's sort of a, definitely a background uh, buzzing uh, guiding principle for a lot of, a lot of what I'm working on. Mm. All right, a third question. This one's back to Evan from Tanya in Orange County. As America moves from a multicultural place to more of a polycultural realm, one that is cross-cultural and where individual identity is grounded in cultural centricity, how will this affect cuisine trends? Wow. <laughs> Gee, that's easy to answer. <laughs> I, was actually, I was actually thinking about this this morning, in fact, I and mean, I'm not kidding, how, well, with, the, with uh, this, this generation of chefs, that we've seen 
expressed through, through, through their own personal stories. Um, I think that's only going to become more heightened, although I, part of me feels like the response to COVID in restaurants is going to be to pull back and, um, and rely on comfort on, on foods that can be prepared more easily, more cheaply, um, with more accessible ingredients. Um, but I, I really think that, um, you know, what Craig said before about being adopted, I wasn't adopted, but um, I was the only child of a single parent. And I lost my father very young. And when he died, that side of the family never spoke to me again. I was eight years old. And um, so this sense of feeling adrift and not attached to uh, my family and to my Jewish heritage um, made me into a voyeur that I spent so much time in people's houses after school when I was a kid. And I just came to really feel deeply that every single house was its own culture. And I think that we keep seeing that story told over and over and over again through food now. And there are Venn diagrams where we link, but I really believe that, that the culture of, of place-based foods is never monolithic. Okay. Thank you. That was a great answer to a great question. Evan, uh, last question for both of you. This one's to Craig, but feels like could go to Evan as well. Michelle from Vegas asks, which perils of technology worry you most? Wow, uh, the perils of technology. There's so many to choose from. So many, <laughs> it's, it's the sport the voting of, machine. of perils. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. You know, I, 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 I don't, um, I, I think there's a, there's much more nuance to the badness and goodness of technology than often gets discussed, um, publicly. And so part of, part of, I think what, what worries me, and I guess is present in, in my work is more just a generalized, uh, ability to be quiet with yourself. That's that, that, that which is sort of almost agnostic about, you know, is it social media or is it YouTube? Is it, you know, just video games, whatever. But this ability to kind of just pull away from things um, and to spend time alone and to reflect. And, uh, you know, I, I, I framed in, in my I put a, I sent a newsletter yesterday where I was talking about bullies and what is it? What, what worries a bully? You know, what, what makes a bully most fearful? And I think alone time, self-reflection, quietude, these are all things that like bullies are, are petrified of because it requires vulnerability and it requires a contention with, you know, who you are, you know, what, what, where you are in the world right now. And so um, just generally, I, I find that it's so difficult to be bored by default uh, that that is the thing that worries me most about today is that I think there's tremendous value in being bored and uh, to, to, to being quiet and to not having something to engage with. So just that generally, uh, you know, as it applies to all technology to me feels um, a little bit worrisome. And for me, I, would, I, I think that's absolutely right on. Um, one aspect of um, the performative nature of social media that I found really threatening during this period, during um, when we all got locked inside, was the type A behavior that just immediately flowered in the food world of everybody doing Instagram lives and everybody doing cooking um, demonstrations. And it, it terrified me, actually. So I went more silent than I have been in years because I felt like it, it seemed to me like it was just a chorus of hands. Just pick me, pick me, pick me. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to compete like that. <laughs> um, 
um, yeah, I, I think that um, quietude is a gift, really. Although, on the other hand, during this period of time, we've actually seen social media used for unbelievable good and connection. You know, I saw, um, I had a family reunion today on which there, there were a hundred people participating. Yeah. And it was incredible, you know? Well, I think like both of you are saying, it's more about selectivity, right? Like that it's not, technology is necessarily bad or good, but it's, um, whether, you know, we choose to still have thinking back to what you guys said earlier about choosing to still be able to sit with something and it can be something that we see on social media, but then, you know, what is the action that we then take after we consume whatever it is on technology? Do we sit with it? Do we quickly move on to the next thing? I love in one of your videos, um, in a YouTube presentation you gave, Craig, you talked about in offices, that if your design team would just throw up an idea and then if you do it on Monday, that nobody can talk about it till Wednesday. Right. I thought that was so smart. Yeah, I think I, I just feel like a lot of what we perceive to be issues with social media, for example, could be mitigated by creating a little more friction. It's that immediacy that often... I think um, rewards a lot of the bad behaviors that we see on the platforms. And so, you know, just applying that principle of forcing you to take a second to just think about what the thing is before, before responding to it, sitting with it for a day or two days, I think can be really powerful. So. Okay. Thank you both so much. Um, I, I'm sure we all look forward to seeing what you write and talk about in Good Food and in your writing, Craig, and um, in the Explorers Club. Thank you again uh, for tuning in and for having this conversation together with us. Thank you Thank so you. much for the opportunity, yeah. for an appointment to think. Yes. <laughs> Thank, yes. You. Thank you. <laughs>